Hey everyone, welcome back to another hardware news recap for the last week. This time we have information on the Intel Minix OS implementation, also talking about the photos of the AMD and Intel MCM integration, along with the Samsung GDDR6 memory uh, progress, we'll call it. NVIDIA has quarterly results, Corsair's got a new world's fastest kit, and uh, Thermal Take has a chair that blows air at your butt. So that's what we have this week. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and NVIDIA with the Destiny 2 1080 Ti bundle. The 1080 Ti SC2 comes with asynchronous fan control for its dual fans, nine thermal sensors, and again includes Destiny 2. Learn more at the link in the description below. Thermal Take has their new X Comfort chair, X for extreme, and it's extreme comfort because it, it plugs into the wall. And it's not what you think. It's not RGB LEDs. No, in fact, it is four fans that are inside of the butt cushion housing, I guess, for the chair. So these four fans for, first of all, let's talk about presentation here. So Thermal Take's uh, image promoting this chair shows hot air entering the fans and coming out into the, uh, the rear end region as cold air. Now, generally speaking, that's not really how air works. It doesn't, it doesn't enter hot and then enter into the case cold, for example. It's not how it works with a case. It's not how it works with a chair either. So uh, what that image would actually depict is that it blasts your butt with hot air, uh, um, it, unless it has a refrigerating unit inside of it or something. But either way, it's got four fans in it and it moves air, and uh, those fans, if you weren't already worried enough about them, spin at 5100 RPM at the high end. 5100 RPM is faster than a Vega reference cooler, which is like 70 decibels of noise when it's at that, at 4900 RPM. Now to be fair, the thermal take fans are larger, so they won't be as loud, but there are also four of them. But then to be fair again, they're embedded inside of a cushion. And if you didn't believe that the chair actually works, let's take a look at the thermal image from the marketing materials. First of all, what's with the scale? Look at that scale. It's 24 degrees Celsius to 28 degrees Celsius. So we've got a really small scale, which exaggerates the differences. And here's the best part. Look at dark blue. The hottest dark blue temperature is 25.5 and the coldest bright red temperature, which of course looks bad, is 26.5. We have a difference of one degree Celsius and yellow occupies something like that, maybe 26 to 26.3. So what's with the scale thermal take? Come on, man, please. The, uh, the chair itself though, if you look at it, we've got some basically temperature values when people sat in it versus, not, okay, okay, it's not the most scientific test, but either way, we've got thermal images for it, I guess. And those thermal images mostly show 0 0.5 degrees Celsius differences. Uh, also, the chair plugs into the wall and has wheels, so just kind of leave that there. So, um, yeah, well, that's, that's what chairs have come to now. There's really no differentiation. And to, uh, <laughs> to Thermal Take's credit, the chairs now are all from the same supplier. So HyperX and Vertigear and Corsair and Thermal Take and basically you name it, they all at least have some parts from the same supplier. So they're not that different. And what you end up with is things like this or things like the whatever company previously did an RGB LED chair. So uh, yeah, other than that, it's got the four dimensional armrests, which means that they move four directions and so does every other gaming chair on the market. And uh, it's got a 331 pound weight limit. And I guess the extra fans could be used to make it a hover chair if you're a lighter or something. That chair, by the way, will cost $500. And the only thing we're looking for next, so Thermal Take, if you're taking ideas here, uh, my suggestion to improve the product would be consider, so you've already thought about something that gamers need, which is cooling. And now consider the next option, which is an integrated septic tank. That would be my suggestion to you. You can have that one for free. So next topic, also gaming chairs, OFM enters the gaming chair market with the uh, aptly titled, I guess, Respawn series, because we need to make sure it sounds gamer to sell to gamers. 
So this is a North Carolina-based company. It's called OFM, and they're entering the already crowded and obviously desperate to differentiate gaming share market with their new respawn line that starts at $140. Uh, so it's it's not the the Paramount $500 four fan chair, but it's more of a normal chair, eight models in total, different colors, feature specifications, and the low-end model is $140, the high-end is $225. They're worth looking at, I guess, but it's all... It's all chairs. That's all they are. They do now. A few years ago, it was all peripherals. Now it's all chairs. We reported on the Intel and AMD collaboration about a week ago where the two companies are working on a multi-chip module or MCM that features 8th generation Intel Core CPUs, the H-series CPUs, along with discrete AMD graphics. Rumors have since indicated that it's a potential Polaris graphics chip in there, not Vega, which from a competitive standpoint, would mean AMD could stay a generation ahead, so that makes some sense. And that's not been confirmed, though, so hold out on that one. What has been more or less confirmed, though, is what the package looks like in its present state. And this is a, a pretty clear actual photo of the thing, not like a faked leak or anything. So this photo was posted on Beyond 3D. It shows the package, which hosts the Intel CPU, AMD GPU, and HBM all on a single substrate. The Intel component will still include its IGP, despite the AMD GPU inclusion. And the idea is that the IGP will be used to take over for lower load, video playback, encode, decode tasks, things like that. Whereas the AMD GPU will be used for actual compute processing and video workloads that require some power. So uh, the result is the IGP is power savings when you're not using the DGPU. And it is basically a DGPU, it's not integrated into the CPU and then you have the power savings otherwise. So that's really the only advancement is the new photo on Beyond 3D. As for other Intel news, Intel using Minix has been pretty big over the past few weeks, and there have been a couple of developments on it. So to recap this, for anyone who's missed it, last week saw the reveal that Intel uses a negative rain, so it's rain negative three for its management engine. And that's where exists a lightweight OS that was built by Andrew Tannenbaum, who is an educator on operating systems. And this Minix OS was initially released under the Berkeley license. So although Minix wasn't intended for use in CPUs or PCHs or really any product outside of educational scenarios, it's also not illegal to use Minix in a corporate setting or in a product. Uh, the license permits freedom to use and modify the code without compensation or technically without any meaningful attribution. So then we fast forward from the Berkeley license release of Minix in 2000 to today, and what we have is that Intel has deployed the OS on a negative rain in all of its CPUs since Skylake, running on a CPU core when you've enabled it to do so. And related to this, more news emerged of possible exploits via physical access, like with a USB device, where you can uh, gain access to a system through this lower level OS. So it's a possible security concern as well. So that catches everyone up, but it's not today's news. It does give backstory though. Today's news is that Tannenbaum released a public letter to Intel. Again, the creator of Minix is Tannenbaum. And he noted that although he doesn't seek compensation, it quote, would have been nice if Intel let him know that Minix was basically the world's most used OS on x86 CPUs now. Tannenbaum had previously answered questions from Intel about reducing the memory footprint of Minix, but wasn't told the context of those questions. He had assumed that it was some sort of Ethernet or graphics chip development. Tannenbaum's letter added a note post-publication stating that, quote, I think creating George Orwell's 1984 is an extremely bad idea, even if Orwell is off by about 30 years. People should have complete control over their computers, not Intel and not the government. Tannenbaum also stated that, quote, Putting a possible spy in every computer is a terrible development. We have links to sources for the full letter and the article linked below in the description, but that's kind of where we stand right now. Still waiting to see if Intel has a response and still waiting to see the implications of all of this. But basically, uh, Tannenbaum is the new development. He's actually spoken and has a pretty uh, reasonably sized letter that addresses all of this. It's an interesting read, so check that out. Next news item is Samsung and GDDR6 allegedly hitting 16 gigatransfers per second, which is beyond the initial 
projections and targets. Samsung has already collected a CES Innovation Award for its GDDR6 memory, which seems to be turning out better than expected. Originally, Samsung stated that their GDDR6 target would offer throughput of 14 gigabits per second. However, the memory appears to already be hitting throughputs of 16 gigabits per second. That's much higher than both GDDR5 and 5X, which launched at 10 but has bumped up to 11 gigabits per second. Moreover, the memory subsystem should operate at 1.35 volts compared to the 1.5 volts it currently takes to drive GDDR5X. We don't yet know about the timings of the memory, which are a major player in performance for all of these GDDR types of memory. At lower matched clocks to GDDR5, G5X performs significantly worse in gaming tasks when considering its higher memory latency. It makes up for this with the frequency bump. The frequency largely makes up for this in Pascal, but latency will remain a question for GDDR6, so we'll have more information about that probably at CES. NVIDIA posted its financial results for its third fiscal quarter, marking a 32% climb year over year in revenue at $2.64 billion, up from $2 billion. NVIDIA noted growth in AI and data center, also noting gaming and automotive technologies as growing sectors, where for automotive, the Drive PX Pegasus was announced as an autonomous taxi solution. NVIDIA also noted adoption by cloud computing giants of the Volta V100 GPU. The world of PC hardware releases isn't that much different from the world of posting a comment on YouTube. Things like first often come up regularly, or fastest, or best, or any other superlative you can name for the most part. Corsair is the latest to employ superlatives in their marketing materials. Corsair has announced what they call the world's fastest 4x8 gigabyte DDR4 memory kit, and this is a 32 gigabyte total kit, which they have claimed is 4333 megahertz. The new Vengeance LPX kits use Samsung ICs and eight layer PCBs with the easily recognizable heat spreaders affixed to those. Timings come in at CL19-262646 at 1.35 volts, and availability is listed as December 2017 with no current word on pricing, though that seems to be in flux as always. Last news item, EKWB is expanding their Coolstream SE series with 420 millimeter and 560 millimeter slim radiators. So EK has two new options for the Coolstream SE lineup and they have zero overhang brass cores and use a 22 GPU fin density with standard G quarter inch ports. The Coolstream SE 420 will go for $90 and the bigger 560 millimeter variant will go for $110. So that's it for this week in hardware news. As always, you can go to gamersnexus.net to pick up the rest of the stories as they're published throughout the week. Store.gamersnexus.net to grab a shirt like this one, a hat like this one, or an Xbox fixing sticker like that one. And patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.